This is so amazing, so amazing. Thank you so much for this uh, lovely introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me here. You know, after a long, long time, I'm actually talking to humans. <laughs> Seriously. It's been so virtual, our world. Uh, our church is still not, uh, we're still online. And uh, we still speak to cameras and machines. Only the production team comes. But uh, this is exciting to see humans and speaking to them. So thank you so much for coming. They say that the first service people are the most holiest people. Is that true? If that is true, put your hands together. Come on. You wake up early. You come before anybody is there. Second service, third service are the lazy people. Uh, don't tell them that I told you this. But you guys are so good. You woke up early. You came all the way. You are brave. And, and, I, and I believe that God's blessing and his anointing would come over your life. You honored him. You have honored him by coming all the way here. God will not leave his reward. You will go blessed today. That, that's, that's our promise. That's our prayer that we have been soaking this entire event in prayer, fasting and praying, coming to Hope You See. Been fasting for seven days. Lord, save us. <laughs> bless us. Talk to us. So very, very exciting. Thank uh, Pastor Scott for this generous, generous uh, invitation here. I want to just thank uh, Alan, my good friend, who pushed me. He said, hey, your wife is coming. Why don't you also come? I'm like, okay. <laughs> She's leading worship. So thank you, Alan and Rufus, Mayuri, uh, Anand. We have been prayer partners actually for many, many years. Every morning he would come home and we used to pray together. Look where God has brought us. So amazing, so amazing. Wow, wow. So just going through all the kidding which is happening on the corona. So I just want to read a few of them. Uh, these are not my confessions, but I've just read it. It says, not even in my wildest dream I imagined myself entering a bank with a mask and asking for money. I don't know how many of you did that. <laughs> Never did I thought that my hands will one day consume more alcohol than my liver. Um, I don't drink, not my confession. <laughs> Somebody said that quarantine seems to be the Netflix series. Just when you think it's over, the next season begins. Someone tell me that if this second quarantine is the same or we get to choose another family altogether. No, I, I like this mask thing now. The other day I went to the supermarket and two people who my own money didn't recognize me. So it's working, it's working good. For all the people, this is, uh, I don't know who, who is this for. I need to social my distance from the fridge. I was tested positive in excessive weight. Okay. For all the people who think that, hey, 2020 has been a bad year, we're not planning to add this uh, 2020 to our age. We didn't even use it, right? That's so unfair. And we want to publicly apologize for 2019, for all the bad things we said about 2019. We thought that year was bad. <laughs> to all the ladies, okay, who prayed that their husbands will be at home spending more time with you. Just have one simple question. How are you doing? <laughs> this is the last one. My washing machine just accepts Shorts and pajamas. The other day I put a jeans and the message came, stay home, stay safe. <laughs> Did that happen to you? So life before uh, post-pandemic was so good, right? We had the freedom to go out anywhere, eat, meet, cheat, do whatever we want. Suddenly, things change after March 25th or 22nd. Until now, it's been so difficult, but somehow we have navigated our way. Correct? We're learning this pandemic, how to move around, how to do things, and uh, somehow what we call this new normal. In Hyderabad, kindly adjust. <laughs> so just adjust. That's what we've been doing, and we, and we call this the new normal. You know, that's the corona culture, but there's a kingdom culture also. And today we have been talking so much about the kingdom. The kingdom culture was God made this perfect world in Garden of Eden. It was beautiful. No work, no homework, no exam. And if you're thinking, hey, anyway, I didn't write my exam. I passed anyway, so don't worry about that. So all the pressures that we have, boss tension, this tension and all, there was nothing. It was a perfect world. That's what God intended. That was such a good world. But, and then man was dissatisfied. They ate, they disobeyed, and we all fell. And ever since that, we have been living this new normal trying to pretend that this is normal. 
But God has great plans to restore us back to that kingdom. So, so nice that, that we'll come back one day. Till then, we're adjusting. Somehow, we're adjusting. And in the New Testament, we see John the Baptist coming on the scene. And he has this one-line message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And he was a cool dude. And you think that leather jackets and all this thing, he was the original guy who wore the leather things. And he was wild. Wild food, wild man. And he just preached one line. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Even just before Jesus came in, he started with that message. And guess what? When Jesus came on the scene, he picked up the same line from John the Baptist and he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of God is near. That's what he said. In fact, he said in Luke 4, he says, I must preach about the kingdom of God because that's why I was sent. So Jesus just kept telling and talking about the kingdom of God. In all his parables, if you see, whether it's the sower or weed or mustard seed, hidden treasure, all his parable were all about the kingdom of God. He would take them and teach the people. And when he picked up the 12 disciples, out of 72, he sent them, he said, go and preach about the kingdom of God. And when the disciples asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Guess what prayer he taught them? Our Father who art in heaven, don't repeat, I'm just saying that. Hallowed be thy name. And then he says, thy kingdom come. Even in the Lord's prayer. In fact, it was not the Lord's prayer. But he taught his disciples. And the third line says, thy kingdom come. And that's what we're going to talk about. Thy kingdom come. And the final journey of Jesus, after his resurrection, 40 days, guess what he preached about? The kingdom. The kingdom. Acts 1.3 says, for 40 days he spoke about the kingdom of God. So even before he came, till the last the day he just ascended to heaven, he spoke about one subject, the kingdom of God. And that will really just bog down your mind and saying, hey, why would he say so much about the kingdom? Why would he speak so much about the kingdom? Because a king will always speak about his kingdom. A king will always speak about his kingdom. And that's why Jesus said, that's why I came. What we lost in Eden, Jesus came back to restore that. Give us a new life. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, these are the same terminologies or the same expressions. So the Jews, they were so reverent about God, they would not just say God, 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 oh my God, oh my God, OMG. They would not say like that. So just to respect that, they would say kingdom of heaven instead of king or kingdom of God. But so they both are same. That's how would they do. But what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is his authority, his power, his purpose. It's not political, it is spiritual. It does not refer to one region or boundaries, but it refers to the entire creation of God. In fact, Psalm says that the Lord establishes throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Over all. So he is the king over all. And when you see, what does the Bible talks about the kingdom? I think I'm losing it. I, are you okay? Yeah, okay. Just need some volume here, please. So when you, when you look into the Bible, in fact, we just read that during the offering time. This is what Jesus says. What is the kingdom of God? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6 talks about life, clothes, eating, drinking, all that. And Jesus is saying, hey, don't worry about that. That will come to you. Look at the birds. They don't sow nor reap, but I provide to them. That's what Jesus said. And he says, don't worry about them. That will come. That is not your problem. God, Jesus says, you seek my kingdom first and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So where is this kingdom? Where is this kingdom? Good question. And Jesus says, behold, the kingdom is within you. Within you. That's where the kingdom begins, inside of your heart. The day when you accepted Jesus, you said, I'm sorry for all my sins. When you repented, the kingdom work began in your heart. It's right within you. Jesus came to bring the kingdom to us and to us, to the kingdom. That was what Jesus did. He bridged that gap. 
we were so far away, but Jesus said, hey, all you have to do is just come, repent, and the kingdom will come. What happens when we get the kingdom? Romans 4, uh, 14, 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating, drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's amazing, right? In, in the midst of this pandemic, we are so worried about our jobs, rightly so. We're so worried about what will happen to me if I contract this disease. Will I live? Will I die? Will I be quarantined? Will I be thrown in Gandhi Hospital? That's worse than death. And what will happen to me? We're so worried about all that. But Jesus says, don't worry. It's not about your eating, drinking, but what God does in your life. And that is, he brings righteousness. He brings peace and joy. That's what God does in your life. It's from the inside out. That's what God does when the kingdom comes in your heart. But what, why do we need this kingdom? Because 1 Corinthians says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. God wants us to live empowered life. It's just not about coming on a Sunday morning, hearing a good message, and you walk away and say, okay, God bless you. I can live my life. No, no, no. God wants you to live Every day, like as you're walking in his presence. Some of you are so holy on a Sunday morning because you, God is here. <laughs> God is in this place. The Holy Spirit is here. But what happens to the Holy Spirit when you go back home? He's still with you. Right. He's still with you. He walks with you every day of your life. So you don't have to pretend saying that only in church I meet with God. No. You can live a good life, spiritual life, empowered life every day of your life. And that's where the manifestation of the Holy Spirit comes. Now, we were praying during our prayer time for the sick. In our church, we have many, many families uh, who got contracted with COVID-19, and we have been praying for them. Uh, it's amazing how, uh, what this journey has taken them. But we have a list, and we keep praying about it. And, you know, seriously, almost about nine out of ten people have been cured. They have come out strong. They have really come out strong. It's only probably the 1% probably who could not make it because of the old age and things like that. But 9 out of 10 people. Uh, because the church, uh, we, we as a church have been fasting for 40 days. Every day we have been praying. Praying for the sick to get healed. For, for demon possessed to go. And when Jesus says that, you know, when you do these things, when the demons are going, that's where the kingdom of God comes in. When we pray the sick are healed, delivered, and I remember that, you know, Anand will remember that, that in our youth camps, we were very, very famous for one thing. Each time the worship would happen, the demons will pop up, pop, 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 and we'll, like, we'll be like stunned, which one to go first? At one time, four, five. And then we would just pray and cast the demon out, and as many of them are in ministry today, doing excellent job. I know that was our favorite time also, because crazy things would happen. And we were new in ministry, so we would just think, should I go or not, just stay here. <laughs> You know, really, but, but God really gave us that power, and we, when we say, come out in Jesus' name, they would come out. I'm like, whoa, this is working. And, and, and God, Jesus says that, that's when you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you, because that's what Jesus did. So the big question is right now, where is the kingdom? Is it here right now? It, did it come with Jesus and go away, or is it going to come? So there are four views to that. L very interesting. So see this. The first view says that, the kingdom came in all aspects when Jesus came, but returned with him when he went away. This was like the trailer. Abhi picture baki hai. You know, it came but went away with Jesus. That's the first view. The second view is the installment view, where it says that Jesus came, started dwelling among us, and then the second installment will come when he comes back again. That's the second view. The third is the complete. It's already here. When Jesus came, all the kingdom came. But Thy kingdom come. That prayer will be incomplete, right? That doesn't go well. Why would Jesus still pray, thy kingdom come? Why would he teach his disciples, thy kingdom come? So that's not true. The fourth and the complete view is, the kingdom was inaugurated when Jesus came. But he'll find his completion when he comes back again. Till then, we're in this new normal. Kindly adjust. We're living our lives. We, we fall sick. We sin, we get up, we walk with Jesus, uh, things are not going great, but this is not what God wanted us to do, right? He wanted us to live a perfect life, but there is coming a day. There is coming a day 
where Jesus is going to come back and the entire kingdom of God will be back. We'll be living in an amazing world, the, the real normal, not the new normal. That's where we are waiting for. So most of the time that Jesus spoke to his disciples uh, or to the people were in parables. Parables, okay? In case that the word is a big word to you, I'll simplify that. A parable is something like an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Can you look at your neighbor and see that? You look very serious, guys. So uh, I, I can't even see your smiles here because you have masks. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's what a parable is all about. So in Matthew 13, there are almost eight parables. Don't worry, I'm going to spare. We're not going to do all eight. Otherwise, you will say, give my money back. <laughs> this is not what I signed up for church this morning. No. So, but I'm, we're just going to just pick up a few parables. And that's where we're going to get into the message. Uh, what was all this about? Introduction. Okay. <laughs> so Matthew 13, it says, the disciples came and asked Jesus, why do you preach or why do you uh, speak to people in parables? And I want you to listen to this very, very carefully because this is where it will all begin for you. Matthew 13, I'll read from the message version. He replied, you have been given the insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight. It has been given, it hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone has a ready heart to this, the insight and the understanding flows freely. But if there is no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. And that's why I talk to you in stories or parables, to create readiness, to nudge the people towards receptive insight. This is for you. Jesus was simply saying, the reason why I talk to you in parables, so that I can create readiness in your heart. So that you will be more receptive when the word is coming. This morning time, you can be sitting here, but your heart can be totally off. Your mind can be off. You can be somewhere thinking about your girlfriend or your boyfriend, or what should I cook, or where, where shall we go for lunch? You can have hazard thoughts, but if your heart is ready this morning time, and I want you to just give me your 15 minutes, next 15, 20 minutes. Think about it, because when your heart is ready, Jesus says, then the message will come to you directly. Otherwise, it's going to just bounce off. It's going to be one more Sunday where you came to church and nothing really happened. And you think, hey, this church is not good. Or the preacher was bad. <laughs> Don't say that. I'll beat you up. <laughs> so would you just ask God? Say, God, speak to my heart, Lord. Speak to me, Jesus. I've come all the way here to listen to your voice. What a beautiful time of worship we had. And that was just soaking your heart. So when the word falls, it'll fall on the right ground. So let's go to the first parable. And if you made that prayer, I believe God is going to speak to you this morning time. The parable of the hidden treasure. Matthew 13, 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like the hidden treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold everything he had and bought that field. That's amazing. That's what the parable is all about. So Jesus made this very simple story for the people. He said, one man, he was working in the field, and suddenly he stumbled upon a great treasure. He did not know there was a treasure. Probably that was not his land, definitely not his land. And he stumbled upon it, and he's like, whoa, this is a great treasure. Very, very valuable. So what did he do? He concealed it. He put it back again. Why? So others will not steal it. The devil will not steal it, or the thieves will not steal it. The neighbors will not steal it. He concealed it back. He said, this is so good. And the reason he stumbled upon a treasure is because in those times, there were no banks. Okay? So the people would hide their treasures in the earth, either in their houses or in a field. They will just uh, dig it up, put things back. Probably they'll just put a landmark and say, so somebody would have done that, and he stumbled upon that. And when he said, this is so great, I must get this. What did he do? He first secured it. Secondly, he said, this is of extreme value. All that I have is nothing compared to this. I must buy it. So he goes and sells off everything he has. Absolutely everything he has. Takes that money, 
goes and buys that field and takes the treasure. What a story. What a powerful story this is. Because he was overjoyed. There was joy in his heart. My life is good now. I don't have to work anymore because of this treasure. When Jesus was walking on the earth, there was a rich man who came to him. And he ran to Jesus. Rich man. He says, Rabbi, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus says, go sell everything you have and come and follow me. He did not like that advice. He says, too much card. I can't give that away. I can't give that. Literally. He walked away the other direction. Sad. That's what the Bible says. He walked away sad. He did not have the guts. He did not have the guts to follow Jesus because his treasure was everything to him. And here we see a man who finds a treasure, he says, is worth it all. I'm going to waste it all. I'm going to just give everything and follow. And Jesus says, what will it gain a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Amen. man, you can have the best of your job. You can have the best of your income, salary, four-wheeler, flat, everything. But if you don't have Jesus, if you don't have the guts to give some of the things that Jesus is asking you to give, your life is a waste. I'm not saying it. Jesus said that. What will it profit you? What will it profit you if you can't sacrifice that? If you don't have the guts to give it up and follow Jesus, you can never make it to the kingdom. That man just walked away sad. Let me tell you a story of Mr. Singh who was born in a Sikh background in Punjab, now where it is in Pakistan. It was 1903. Father was a very, very wealthy man, very rich, a factory owner, and they were, they were well-to-do in the entire village. He was raised in this Sikh community, the Punjabi community. So as growing up, uh, his religion was everything to him. And in fact, when somebody would speak about God or Jesus, he would take the Bible, tear it off, throw it off. He was anti-Christian. His father finally sent him to England to do his master. So he, he, he goes to England and miraculously, somebody shares the gospel with him. At the age of 26, he accepts Jesus in his heart. And then he says, okay, my studies are over. God is asking me to go back to India and to my own people. So he comes back in 1933 to India with a clear message. I must speak about Jesus to my people. So he comes back. When he returned home, they were so unwelcoming. They said, what? How did you get a foreign God? We don't need you. If you want to stay in this house, if you need all this wealth, if you want all this uh, comfort and prestige, leave this Jesus and come and follow. He said, no. I choose Jesus. He walked away. He did not have food to eat, no home to stay. He slept on the uh, platform for many, many days. It was in Mumbai. Finally, in 1938, he went to Madras and started talking about Jesus. And then to Kerala, tens of thousands of people started following him. And he became a great evangelist to a point that he was the most sought out evangelist in India. There were almost 400 invitations which will come to him in one year. He started praying for people. People started getting healed. Blind started seeing. Deaf started hearing. Great things happened when he prayed and when he preached. From the first church in Madras till today, there were almost 1,000 churches who followed him and who called him their own. And he was Brother Buck Singh. The man that you know and if you don't know him, you will know about him. In the year 1946, he went to Europe, US, Canada, Australia, preaching about the kingdom of God, about the gospel. God took him to great heights. And in 1950, God gave him a small, not a small, but a small uh, community there. He says, go plant a church. And he began to do that near RTC X Roads. And it was called Hebron. How many people had heard about Hebron? Yeah. Are you from Hebron? Anybody here? Brothers, are you from here? <laughs> Sisters, okay. So he is the one who established the work of Hebron right in Hyderabad. From 1950 to 1970, great things happened. The church multiplied and grew. In fact, he was called uh, the Elijah of 21st century. He established almost 10,000 churches. 10,000 churches until 2000. He served God till the age of 97, and then he passed away. It was on the Friday, 22nd September, 
2000, the city of Hyderabad came to stand still because there were 2.5 lakh people who came to give respect to this man of God. The whole city was jammed because one man said, I'll rather have the treasure. I will seek Jesus. I will go after God. Then all these things. He was very, very wealthy. Left everything. He says, I will follow Jesus. What a story. And that's what Jesus says. When you find the kingdom, when you find Jesus, it would be a tragedy for you to walk away without him. It would be such a disaster for you not to follow him. But once you give your heart to Jesus, your life to Jesus, he can do amazing, amazing things in your life. That's what Jesus was talking about. The next parable is all about the wheat and the weed. Uh, no, not this weed. It's, uh, it's, it's a different weed, okay? So uh, this is how it goes. Matthew 13 says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the man who sowed the good seed in the field. And while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed the weed among the weeds and went away. When the weeds sprouted, formed head, then the weeds also appeared. This is the story. So both were planted. The farmer did a good thing. He sowed the wheat, which you eat, atta, and all these things, chapati. And it was a good seed. It was sown in the right time for a good purpose. But the enemy came and did something bad. He sowed the weeds. Weeds are jungly plants. Good for nothing. You know, jungle, like you don't have to do anything also. It'll just come on its own sometimes, uninvited. And both of them were sown at the same time, one after the other. And Jesus says the enemy did that. Enemy did that. Who is our enemy? Jesus says in John 10, tell, the enemy, this thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the thief comes for. That's exactly what happened. The thief came and sowed bad seed, the weeds. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life and life in what? Abundance. Abundance. That's what Jesus does. And the enemy did this. Why would he do that? To destroy the crop, to destroy our lives. You know, the, uh, he does not like you. He's not friendly and he doesn't have a sense of humor. He's bad. And the enemy will come to kill, kill to steal and to destroy your life. That's what he does. They were all, they were sown together and they were grown together also. They, as the, the, the weed came up, the weeds also came up. And as you can see the picture, uh, just put the first picture, please. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the actual picture. And I dare you to tell me which is the wheat and which is the weed. You can't tell the difference. You cannot. Because they are so identical. They appear the same. They look the same. You cannot tell what is what from that field. The next picture, please. When you look closely, even it's really hard to find out which is what. But because I wrote the titles, you can read it because you're smart people now. So you know the difference. But when they're growing, you cannot find the difference at all. I want to challenge you. Is it possible to look like a Christian, dress like a Christian, hang around like a Christian, sing like a Christian, and not be attached to Christ at all? Is it possible? I did that many years of my life. Oh, oh, many, many years. My father was a great pastor, evangelist. I used to fast 40 days from class 3. Read the Bible, pray, go to church, but not yet connected to Jesus at all. Lived my life. Monday to fr Friday, Saturday, did whatever I wanted. And Sunday, praise the Lord, Sotram, hallelujah. It was all about that. I know we could switch lives. We could switch the mode and live like that. Is it possible that we can be like that? Look like a wheat, but we are weed. Sing like, act like, but yet so different. Yeah, it is possible. Oh, we know that game very well, right? How to play on Sunday and how to play on a weekday. But one of the greatest thing is the, the fruit. When you open up the head and see what is there, when you open up the weed, you will fly in a black thing, which is nothing, actually. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. You eat that, you will die. No, you, will, you might not die. You will faint away. We'll have to put you in the hospital. But it's nothing. It's not good. But when you open the wheat head, you will actually find the grain. You will find the wheat. 
that's how you will actually come to know which is good and which is bad. And that can happen only when they mature up. In the initial stage, you will not know the difference at all. Absolutely. So when the, when the hired man came to the farmer and says, shall we pluck out the weeds? He said, no, don't do that. Why? Because in doing so, you might just tear off the wheat also. He said, let them grow. Let them grow. And when the harvest is ready, we will separate them. Here's a true story right from our church. And I've changed the name. His name is Ravi. Ravi was basically not from a Christian background. He grew up in Bangalore. And he lost his mother at the age of 16. So the father remarried. And had, they had a, he had a stepmother. Things did not go well with him and the mother. So the father drove them out, him and his brother, 16 and 17, out of the house and says, go fend for yourself. So for many days, they did not have job. Finally, he hired himself in a hotel and began to work there at a very low wage. And that's how they could just survive, eat the food and stay there. And as he began to work in the hotel industry, many people would come, customers would come, Political leaders would come, and very soon he began a small gang there. These guys said, hey, you look good, you're young, would you like to work for us? He says, what do you want, mean? He said, we have a group, we are a religious group and a political group, we'll give you lots of money if you work for us. And he said, fine, as long as I get the money. So he joined that gang, and he began to smoke and drink and drugs, all that he did, and they started giving him assignments. Assignments to go and beat up people, kill people, murder people, exactly. He murdered several people, and, but because of the political co connections, he never made it to the jail. He was living a very comfortable life, but yet very, very sad. But one incident changed his entire life. You know what a supari means, right? No, no, no. Go, they give it to kill somebody. So the political leaders or the religious uh, group, they gave him one supari, said, you have to go to this meeting and kill this evangelist. That was his assignment. So seven or ten of them got together. They traveled all the way from their place to the meeting where it was happening. And for sensitivity, I will not give you the name of the person. So they go to the meeting, and uh, there were thousands of people. And this evangelist is just gunning down, praying for people, prophesying. And these guys are all ready with chakus and things like that. And they're coming closer and closer and closer to the stage, up till almost they could see the preacher eye to eye. And then as they were about to attack, this evangelist stopped the meeting and says, Ravi, God loves you. God has great plans for you. He's going to change your life. And this guy was fully drunk. In an instant, he became sober. He says, who is this man? How does he know my name? How does he know my name? His God must be really powerful. His God must be really powerful that he knows my name. And he just turned away and went back to his city. He went back and started thinking about that. Thinking about this God, and he says, why would this God love me, and how does he know my name? That was the biggest mystery for him. But something happened in his life. He began to detach himself from that gang. He said, I'm not going to just do all this killing and doing all that. Uh, and something changed in his heart. And then he, he went to one church in Bangalore. He walked into that church. Uh, he got the gospel. And um, somebody baptized him there. Then he went to the Bible college. But while he was doing all that, his gang did not like that. So they put all the cases against him now. All the cases which were closed, he murdered people. So they, they got him out from there and put him in jail now. So he was in jail, but God saved him from there. Because of his good behavior, his sentence was marked, and he could come ba uh, back out. And then he changed his city. And then he came to Hyderabad. That's the story. Now, the story does not end there. It's a very classical story of a wheat and a weed. I'll tell you why. So now he's doing really good. He became a, a, a nice evangelist now, uh, picked up a job, doing great things. But yet, he had anger issues, bad temper, bad anger issues, to a point that he started beating people again. And then he backslid for almost 10 years of his life. 10 years. Stopped going to church, no reading Bible, no praying big mess of his life, yet he did not go back to the gang, but he lost 10 years of his life until he fumbled again to our church a few years back and uh, God touched his life 
and uh, he's living a very good life, married, two kids. I, I went to his home, actually, and then I said, tell me your story. I did not know what's going to come. <laughs> and this is what it came. I'm sitting there, like, shocked. I'm like, whoa, what a story. What a powerful story. But this is to tell you that it is possible for us to sway from a weed to weed, weed to weed. But if we are faithful, God is more faithful. T times that God gives us time, his judgment says, okay, let me be patient. Let me be patient. The end of the story is the weeds were collected and put in a barn. But the weeds were collected for fire. Simple as that. Why? Because there's nothing good about the weeds. Absolutely nothing good. They take it and burn it. The weeds are taken to be consumed. They're helpful. They're useful. You know, that's what eternity is all about. Jesus was saying something very similar. He says, hey, what are you growing up as? Are you pretending to be the good one or the bad one? But in the end, there are only two places. Life has many choices, right? Many, many choices. But eternity has only two. That's what Jesus says. Either it is heaven or hell. Either you, you be in a, the good production or you're just put in the fire and be burnt. As simple as that. I'm not trying to, to scare you in any way, but that's what this parable is all about. The next parable I wanted to take is the parable of the ten virgins. And uh, you know the story. I'll just read one verse for you. It says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like the ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish, five were wise. Very simple story and a very powerful story. And the whole premise is this. In the Jewish custom, uh, if you fell in love with a girl, uh, they would have the engagement. Very, very, very similar to what we do in India, right? So the, both the families meet and uh, they have a talk. Then they get engaged. And between the engagement and the wedding, there's one year, one full year. And this full year is for two good reasons. Number one, preparation. The bride is making herself ready for the groom in every possible way. Physically, she keeps herself pure and holy and a virgin. She's learning all the cooking, all the skills, all that. She's doing all that. And the groom also has a responsibility. His responsibility is to go find a place, uh, clean the place, uh, probably pick up a house, keep things ready, the house ready for his new bride. Two things. And in John 14, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come back and take you to be with me. So where I am, you can be also. What a powerful illustration of Jesus' second coming. And he talks it here. So what happens now? So this, the story is this. So this is a typical Jewish story where all the ten virgins are waiting for one person, the bridegroom to come. Five are wise, five are foolish. That's what it says. You know, but all of them have good intention. Why? Because they are all virgins. That means their character is good. Their intention is good. They're all waiting. Good intention. Waiting for the bridegroom to come. So he can, you can go. They were all dressed up. Everything was there. There was except one difference. What made them the foolish and what made them wise is the preparation, the oil. They were prepared for the bridegroom, no matter what it comes. When he comes, how he comes, wherever he comes. They were all prepared. The wise took extra oil with them. Absolutely extra oil. Uh, they, it's called the extra virgin oil. So I don't know what is uh, uh, about that. But they, they carried that. Uh, they carried that oil with them and they were ready. And what happens? The bridegroom will not tell you what time he would come. That, that was a mystery. They had to be prepared. And suddenly, at midnight, the cry says, hey, here comes the bridegroom. Here comes the bridegroom. And everybody woke, wake up. They're trying to get things ready. And the, the foolish ones did not have enough oil to light it up and go and receive the bridegroom or go in the procession. But the wise ones had it all. So the bridegroom came. They were ready. He took them. And he goes off. And Jesus is saying, that's how it's going to be in the end times. That's how it's going to be 
whoever is ready. I'm going to just take you off and go. You cannot tell. Please, time please. Give me a little more time. Or help me to just repent. You don't have time. The story says that they went out to buy oil. By the time they came in, the bridegroom came and he was gone. He took the ready ones and it was gone and the door was shut. The door was shut. They started knocking and said, sir, sir, please open the door. Please open the door. You know what the bridegroom says? Get away from me. I don't know you. That's really harsh. Harsh. He says, I don't know you. Get away. It's almost like, go away. Your time is up. And he says something like this to his disciples. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour of his coming. Probably three months back, we thought that Jesus is coming soon. All the preachers started preaching. This is the end time. And maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You know, we, we got really scared of the things which were happening in our world. But more than anything else, if you are a Christian, probably you've been, mean, you've been hearing this from last 2,000 years, right? Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, he's not coming only. You're waiting, waiting, he's not coming, nothing is happening. And you think, hey, come on, Jesus is not going to come. I have still more time. I still have a lot of time. I don't have to repent now. I can still go on with my life. And if that is your dialogue, and what if Jesus suddenly comes? You cannot borrow your salvation. Nobody is going to give you the light. Nobody is going to give you the oil. You have to do it for yourself. But genuinely think about this. Forget the second coming. What if your going is coming first? What if you die? Yeah. It's, it's crazy things are happening all around. Accidents to sickness to suicides to so many things are happening. Even if Jesus is delayed in coming, what if your going is first? Then Jesus, where will you end up? Are you prepared? If you die today on the way back to church, you will not I'm not prophesying. I promise you, you will not. But I'm saying, where will you end up? Are you prepared? Are you connected to Jesus? Or are you still dilly dallying? Hey, when it comes, it comes. I will do it. I will repent. What if you don't have time? That's what this parable is all about. What waiting and watching for? That's the kingdom of God. And the last one is the mustard seed. Jesus was comparing the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, tiniest seed, so tiny that you can't even see it properly. In fact, you can't see the mustard only, imagine the seed. And Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven is like the mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seed, when it grows, it is the largest garden plant and becomes a tree so that the birds can come and parch in his branches. Ah, oh, simple, humble beginning. You see, saw that. And that's how Christianity began, right? When Jesus came on the earth, he started preaching about the gospel. Some people started following him, one or two. Then he picked up 12 disciples. And he started pouring his heart and life into them for three and a half years. By the day of Pentecost, how many people were there? 120 people were there on the day of Pentecost. And then we see 3,000 people were added to the church in one single day when Peter preached the gospel. 3,000. And then 5,000 more came in Acts 4.4. So by the time, in few years, there were almost 50,000 Christians in Jerusalem. 50,000. Started off very small, but started growing, growing, growing. Do you know how many Christians are there right now? Approximately in India, 14 million people out of 140 million. China, right now, has probably the largest Christian population in the entire world because of the sheer population and the number of people who are coming to know Jesus every single day. is growing. There is said by the missions directors and all that, every day there are almost 80,000 people 
who come to know Jesus. They get the gospel, they come into the kingdom. 80,000 people approximately. There are almost 510 churches which gets added to the kingdom of God on a daily or weekly basis. That's how the kingdom is growing. Do you know the percentage of Christians right, right now? 22.18 billion around the world who profess to follow Jesus around the world. 2.18 billion Christians. That's staggering numbers. Though there's still so much more to go. But just start off like a small seed. And it grows. It's growing. I want to ask you. This morning time, as we just wrap up the whole thing. Are you part of that kingdom? Do, are you part of that kingdom? And the Bible talks about the end times. In Isaiah 11, it says that the beautiful world altogether where the wolf and the lamb will sit together, the cow and the young people will play, the serpent will play, says God is going to create a new world altogether. A beautiful kingdom is coming. New heavens, new earth. Revelation 21 talks about that. In Revelation 22, the garden is restored back to its original form. Comes back to great, the, the real normal, not the new normal. God is restoring things back, his kingdom back. What Adam lost in Eden, Jesus came to set it up, but it will find its completion in the end, in Revelation. Till then, we have to adjust like this, but you can have a great life. All the parables that we spoke about, whether it was the parable of the hidden treasure, it's worth wasting it all. Absolutely. I can sell my, that's what I did literally. I sold myself to follow this Jesus. I gave it all. My job, my everything, my friends, pleasures, sins, everything I gave it up just to follow Jesus. It's worth it all. You can waste it. The parable of the wheat and the weed, oh, you can pretend till Jesus comes. But if you really want to genuinely change, like the way God changed Ravi's life, you can choose that. Are the virgins, do you want to be the five foolish or the wise one? You're ready. It's worth waiting for. Or the mustard seed is worth working for. There's so much of work to be done. Right among your friends, in your family. Can I ask you to close your eyes, please? This morning, as you go back to your home, would you make a choice? Would you tell Jesus that you're all in in this kingdom? Giving it all, following it all, working it all? Are you want to work for Jesus? Or if you didn't get a chance to give your life to him completely, You've been walking 50-50. You didn't surrender your life completely to Jesus. Whether you're sitting in this hall or whether you're sitting at your home and watching. Wherever you are. All you have to do is just lift up your hands and say, Jesus, I come back home. I want to come back home like the prodigal son. And if that is you, I want you to lift up your hands. Come on, wherever you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whoever you are, just lift it up to Jesus because God is in this place. And God is in the place where you are sitting. Maybe it's in your bedroom or hall, in your home. The presence of God is there. You just have to lift it up to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is my life. Oh God, I want to be ready when you come, Lord. I want to walk with you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Would you all please stand up to your feet and lift up those hands to heaven this morning time. And sing it out to Jesus. Come on, with all your heart. With all your heart. Oh God, we thank you, Lord.